Thank you. Thank you very much, Umberto. Thank you very much to the organizers. I'm officially a track organizer, but I think it's not really true, uh, for having invited me to speak here and to give a little introduction to the interaction of topology and artificial intelligence. So topology provides useful dimensionality reduction techniques for applying to big data. In particular, I've applied them in the context of data from neuroscience, but they're it's applicable far beyond neuroscience. This visualization that I'm showing here is from the work that I've done together with people in the Blue Brain Project, where we found multiple interesting applications of topology and machine learning to studying neuroscience. So let me just say a few words about myself before I start. So I spent... A, about 20, 25 years of my career doing only pure algebraic topology, and have really discovered the very powerful and interesting applications of topology in the last uh, five years or so. And actually, I know very little about machine learning. I'm kind of a fraud up here, because what I really am is a user of these techniques. And I hope to give you like a broad overview of how some, some of these interactions between topology and machine learning, and to convince you maybe that these are <coughs> particularly powerful and interesting techniques. And then the other speakers who really are experts in these areas will explain more about the, the details here. So let's see, is this actually working? Oh, I need to put this, sorry. Is the, this thing is not in place. There we go. There we go. Now it should work. Let's try. Yes, okay. So a little bit about what topology is. I promised in the abstract of this talk that I would not assume you actually knew what topology was. So topology is the mathematics of shape. It's the mathematics that describe, it's good for describing notions of connectivity, how things are connected together, for studying networks in particular. It's also the mathematics, it's a kind of mathematics that's particularly well adapted to studying local to global relationships. So if I have a bunch of local information about a system, about a network, about a point cloud of data, how can I put those pieces together to get a more global image of what's going on? So what's happened over the last say 15 years or so, is it's turned out that topology has proved to be a useful tool in data analysis. So that, in fact, it turns out that you can, if you call on your friendly topological analyst, analyst can provide all sorts of interesting new perspectives on the analysis of data. And this leads to interactions with machine learning as well, because you have to figure out how, that, uh, how machine learning can ingest this sort of information and what sort of, how you can then interpret the output. So I'm going to start with a brief introduction, very brief, very uh, overview, of what's called topological data analysis, or TDA. So the guiding philosophy of TDA is that if you have big data, if you have a point cloud of, say, high-dimensional data, one way to try to start to understand the data and let it speak to you is to look at its shape, which you want to try to encode by some sort of topological signature. And I'm going to describe a few of these possible topological signatures, which again, you can then use to, as input to different machine learning tools to work on problems of, for example, classification and so on. So let me describe the usual workflow that we have in TDA. So you start with some data of some kind, all kinds are possible to input here. And you find some way of transforming this data into a point cloud. That is to say, a collection of higher dimensional vectors somewhere that you would like to study. And usually you're assuming, though this isn't always the case, that you have a lot of these data points and they are fairly high dimensional. And then you want to say, okay, how can I study this complex data using the tools of topology. Now topology, usually if it's thinking about a point cloud, it's just you have some sort of finite set of points in a high dimensional space. Topology in its usual guise will not see anything interesting about that. But if you're clever about this, and this was the techniques that were introduced by Adolf Brunner and Carlson and various others at the beginning of this field, they said, wait a second, we can actually use topology to understand the geometry of this data set by thinking about things in a filtered way, which is what I'll explain. So what you have is a way of converting this point cloud into a sequence of topological spaces. So they are all contained one in the other. So a bunch of different geometric objects that sort of live within each other, just like this little sequence of, of shapes here. And then you study the particular qualities, the shape qualities of these different 
objects, these different geometric objects, and out of that you extract some kind of signature, which one version of which is often called a barcode, which is why I chose this particular illustration. I'm going to go into more detail about how you abstract this sort of barcode from the point cloud data, and then talk a little bit as well about how you can then use these barcodes to interpret your results and to come up with some sort of classification or other result like that. So the first step is to go from data to a point cloud, all kinds of data. In particular, you can consider time series data. And there, can be, there are various ways, some of which Nikki Sanderson is going to describe in a little while, about how to convert this sort of point cloud, this sort of time series data into a point cloud. So some collection of vectors in, well, here's only a three-dimensional space, but maybe even a higher dimensional space. And then you'd like to say, is there some particular shape to the data that we're interested in studying? So here, if we look at this particular passage here, you say, oh, there's some sort of periodic motion here. Well, this is obvious here as well, but here it really comes very clear that you see this sort of circular structure here. And you'd like to be able to characterize that and extract some sort of usable signature from this data. So how do we go from a point cloud of data like this to one of these nested sequences of shapes that I was talking about? The standard way to do so is as follows. What we're going to do is consider, so here's our point cloud here, a bunch of points now in the plane, and we're going to consider little balls or disks around these points. And then we let these balls grow slowly. And whenever the two balls intersect, you're going to connect them by an edge like this. And as the balls grow, then you're going to start seeing more and more complex structures like ring structures here and longer bits that are connected together. What you see is the number of individual components is decreasing as this happens. We grow it again. Now we have even more complex structures. Here we have a little tiny loop. Here we have another one. And so we, they're getting more and more connected. Here, everything is all connected together, making a big loop like this. And then we have another small loop that's still there and still there. And it grows even more. In the end, what's left is this sort of big circular structure here. And you grow it more and more. And in the end, it's all filled in like this. And so you get this sequence of these geometric shapes that are included one in the other as the radius of these little balls increases. So we get this sequence of what are called nested complexes, and we can apply the standard tools of algebraic topology to this nested sequence of complexes in order to extract some kind of signature. So here is basically how we do this. So suppose we have this particular sequence of complexes. So here, each one has a certain number of points, a certain number of edges, either empty or filled in triangles. And the sort of signature that you can look at in each case is, for example, how many different components do you have? How many different disconnected pieces do you have? So this is what beta, beta zero is measuring here. And then beta one is measuring the number of loops, the number of cycles you have in the structure. So here, we don't have any loops. Beta one is zero. And we have three different components. So beta zero is three. Here, we have four different components. And now we actually have a little cycle. So beta one is four. Here we have two cycles. This one became filled in with a triangle, so it's not a cavity anymore. And here we have now just two components. Here we still have two different components. And we have just one loop left. So we track this kind of data. You can do this in higher dimensions as well, where you track cavities of higher in higher dimensions. Here it's just showing the number of components and the number of loops that you have. What you do then to convert this into this barcode that I talked about is as follows. So we have four different steps in this filtration, in this sequence of nested complexes. And in step one, you just note, OK, how many components do I have? And you just see how long these different components last in the structure. So for example, this element here, it's there, it's there, it's there, it's there. It's its own component all along. So that gives us a component that lasts like this. And then here we have this edge being included in here, being included in here, and so on. This is another component that lasts throughout the filtration. Then we have other bits that disappear. So for example, this one was an independent one, but then it became attached to these guys, and so it gives a bar like this. In this same way, you can track the number of loops that are in your complex, and again, extract a sequence of bars like this. And this is what's called the barcode in dimension zero or in dimension one, and you can do it in higher dimensions as well, <coughs> of your complexes. And this is a useful topological signature of your point cloud data. Another way to interpret this kind of data is to convert 
a barcode into what's called a persistence diagram. It's the same way, it's an equivalent way of tracking the same information, which it can be more useful in certain contexts. So here we have one of these barcodes here. So it's a sequence of bars of various lengths. And what you do is you, try, you look at where each bar starts and where it ends. And that pair of what we call birth and death give us coordinates. This is our birth axis, this is our death axis. So here we have a bar that lasts from zero filtration to the second filtration. So that's born at zero, dies at second. Here we have another one that's born at two, dies at four. So that's, sorry, whoop, this one here. So each one of these bars is converted into a point in the upper right-hand quadrant of the plane, producing what's called a persistence diagram. And this is the usual output of topological data analysis techniques. It provides a way of capturing, encoding the signature, the, the shape of the original data cloud. Now, if you're going to do any sort of interesting statistics on a system like this, you need some sort of stability, which is to say, if I perturb my original data a little bit, I want my output not to be too different. You need that kind of stability for this sort of tool to be useful. So it turns out that if you look at the set of either barcodes or persistence diagrams, there are natural ways of equipping these sets with notions of distance, which are earth mover type distances, uh, either of LP or LFN type, that enable us to talk in a reasonable way about when two barcodes or when two persistence diagrams are close to each other. And it turns out that if in most of the instantiations of this TDA pipeline that we consider, this whole process is essentially Lipschitz continuous with respect to some notion of distance between point clouds, we usually use what's called the Hausdorff distance, and this sort of L infinity type distance that we have between persistence diagrams. So there is the sort of stability that one needs in order to have a reliable analytical tool. Now, if you actually want to do something with this, then you need software. There are people who have uh, mostly open source software that has been produced, most notably recently here at DPFL by L2F, created this beautiful library called Giotto, where you have access to all of these tools for doing all kinds of different topological data analysis computations. And importantly, I mean, once you've done this, this analysis, you'd like to say, okay, what is this topological signature telling you about your original data? How can you then interpret the output? And there are more and more inverse analysis tools available. And in particular, I'd like to cite the work of Yasuo Hiroka, who's developed some really nice ways to take the output of this TDA and look back, okay, in the point cloud and say, where are these significant features coming from? One point I would like to make briefly is, let's see, let me go back quickly to this persistence diagram. If you think about the points that are close to the diagonal here, those would correspond to very short bars. And what people often think of these points that are either close to the diagonal or these short bars as being sort of noise. They're noisy features, they're not persistent. You're interested in what topological features actually persist over a long time. And that's usually a good approach, but one needs to be careful because it can happen that a small bar like this or a point that's close to the diagonal could actually encode important information. Okay. So, TDA and machine learning, how do they interact? So, it's quite hard. I mean, if you look at the set of barcodes or the set of persistence diagrams equipped with the metric, doing statistics in this space is a hard problem. I mean, you can actually can do, how do you take an average of persistence diagrams or an average of barcodes? So what you have to do is featureize this. So you have to take this, use some sort of kernel methods in, in general to translate this problem about barcodes and persistence diagrams into a situation where you can actually do some computation. So you translate it into some vector space, for example, equipped with some sort of inner product, some sort of notion of similarity, and then you can do the statistics in this space. And one very interesting recent development, in my opinion, of Legoni, Udo, and Tillman, is there's a new differentiable approach to doing this sort of featureization, enabling the application of gradient descent methods in this context as well. So an example of this so suppose we have a barcode here, and you want to translate this barcode into something you can actually study more easily, like a function. So what one usually does is to create what's called a Betty curve. And a Betty curve, now for each value here, counts how many bars exist at that point. So for example, here in one filtration, we have three different bars that exist at that point, and so our Betty curve gives us a value of three at the filtration value one. So you take this 
complicated barcode, and you translate it into a curve. And then you can start thinking about doing some sort of statistical methods. So you can go from a nested complex to a Betty curve as follows. So here we have a little tiny complex where we have edges of different lengths, alpha less than beta less than gamma. And then we start including the edges as we go along various thresholds. So once we hit a high enough threshold, then we include these edges in the complex. So at threshold zero, we have only the vertices. At threshold alpha, we have only these edges here. Threshold beta, we add these edges as well. And threshold gamma, we include this edge here, and it gives us two completed simplices. We can then look at the associated uh, Betty numbers and form the Betty curves by looking, for example, here we had four components. Here we have it drops down to two components at alpha, drops down to one component at beta, and then it stays at one. And then for Betty one, we're counting the number of loops. And so this is a way we can go from a complex like this to these curves. These curves would seem, these curves would seem to hold a lot of information. Uh, sorry, would have seemed to have lost a lot of information, but in fact, they turn out studying these Betty curves associated to the diagram like this provides us with a remarkable amount of information. Even when you do something as silly as extracting, or seemingly silly, as extracting various numerical features from these curves, such as the maximum value of the curve, or where the curve atten attains its maximum, or what that maximum value is. Just those very simple numerical variants associated to Betty curves contain a remarkable amount of information that is easy, apparently, to ingest, to digest by machine learning tools. There are also ways to convert uh, a barcode into what's called a persistence landscape, which really looks like a mountainous landscape. It was invented by somebody who was actually a postdoc here at one point. I often wondered whether he was inspired by the scenery when he defined these landscapes. But this is another format that we can study by, uh, in which we can study statistics properly. And there's a nice notion of distance there. There are various variants of this. This is from a paper by Chung and Lawson that appeared on the archive last year, which generalized simultaneously the notions of Betty curves and persistence landscapes and en enable us to study these data clouds from many different perspectives and obtain interesting information. One more method is to use what are called persistence images. In this case, you start with your persistence diagrams. You replace each point by an appropriate Gaussian. You smooth this out, you discretize, and it gives you now, you can think of this as a matrix of pixels with various values, and you can study the statistics of these collections of persistence images, which are nothing but matrices, in fact. This turns out to be an extremely useful way to study this. We use this for studying neuromorphologies, for example. All kinds of machine learning methods can be applied to featureize TDA, decision trees, random forests, support vector machines, CNN, and most recently, and most interestingly, in my point of view, graph CNNs. I think that there's a lot of potential for interactions between topology and machine learning. And more recently, people have started using topological methods to analyze what's going on during machine learning, analyze the evolution of the weights in a neural network. This is uh, starting with people like Gunnar Carlson and so on, looking towards explainable AI, that somehow you can now use these TDA techniques to study what's going on in machine learning. Some examples in which I, in particular, have been involved in applying these methods successfully and obtaining interesting results concern topological characterization of these neuromorphologies using persistence images that we somehow we associated persistence diagrams that we obtained from different neuromorphologies. Also, classification of dynamic regimes in neural networks. And here was where I was really struck by the fact that very simple techniques would help us. I'm on my second to last slide. And also for high throughput screening of nanoporous materials. So, thank you very much for your attention. It was a pleasure to introduce this session, and I look forward very much to hearing what my colleagues have to say. <laughs>